Okay. We're live? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So welcome to the AFO Cafe. Uh, these are informal science conversations about all things birds. And I am Valentina Ferretti, the current president of the Association of Field Ornithologists. I'm going to ask all of you um, to turn off your cameras and your microphones, and then um, we will have the presentation. And at the end, you can turn on your cameras again and your microphones, and we can um, chat a little bit about um, the talk if you have questions, et cetera. Um, so let me provide you with a summary of a uh, brief summary of what AFO is all about for those of you who are not members of AFO. AFO was founded in Massachusetts in 1922 as a member-based organization dedicated to the study and conservation of wild birds and their habitats. And we view ourselves as a bridge between the professional and amateur ornithologists. We started out as the New England Bird Banding Association and as our early name suggests, we have a strong interest in the study of banded bird populations. We also have a strong focus in Latin America through outreach programs, joint conferences, and grants. And this year, we are celebrating our first 100 years, and we are organizing an exciting uh, centennial meeting in Plymouth, Massachusetts in October 10 to the 13th, so please mark your calendars. We will uh, soon have our website uh, up and running with the call for abstracts, symposia, and workshops. The AFO cafes are a series of monthly events and next month's cafe will be moderated by Sarah Sargent on April 29th. And she will be talking on the importance of funding programs. AFO cafes are sponsored by Avinet Research Supplies, and Avinet is owned by the Association of Field Ornithologists and exists to serve bird and bat researchers with essential field gear of the highest quality. The USA made misnets and custom manufactured tools for bird banding and measurement represent the core of their offerings. Avinet serves researchers globally who advance science and con um, conservation. And you can visit uh, the website at www.avinet.com to see uh, the product offerings. If you enjoy our AFO cafes or you're, and you're still not a member of AFO, you can become a member to support these and other community engaged events. And today's cafe will be presented by uh, three people that I know from a long time ago, <laughs> Dr. Scott Taylor, Dr. Sean Billerman, and Dr. Robert Curry. And they will be talking about avian hybridization and global change. Uh, Scott Taylor got his PhD from Queens University. He's currently an assistant professor at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And he's also the director of the Mountain Research Station. Um, in his research, he applies genomics and field experiments to natural hybrid zones and closely related taxa in order to investigate the architecture of reproductive isolation and the genetic basis of traits relevant to speciation. Dr. Sean Billerman got his PhD at the University of Wyoming, and he's currently a staff, a staff member of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology at the Birds of the World Project. Sean is broadly interested, interested in understanding patterns of avian speciation. His research takes advantage of museum collection and focuses on using hybrid zones to understand how intrinsic and extrinsic processes have influenced how and where species hybridize and ultimately what factors are important to understanding reproductive isolation. And Dr. Robert Curry got his PhD from the University of Michigan. He's currently a full professor at the Department of Biology at Villanova University. 
Dr. Curry's research interests include the study of the evolutionary, behavioral, and conservation ecology of passerine birds, including hybridizing chickadees, as well as ecology and behavior of herbivorous jumping spiders. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let um, the presenters talk. <laughs> Great, thanks Vale for the introduction and it's it's nice to see you and others that I uh, haven't seen in a while. Um, so I'm gonna just do a brief intro, intro and then turn it over to Bob. Uh, then it'll come back to me and then Sean will round it out. Uh, so it's nice, it's nice to see everyone and have an opportunity to talk about um, our work on avian hybridization and global change. Um, <clears throat> you'd think I'd know how to do this by now, but somehow, okay, there we go. Uh, so <clears throat> this idea that we can use hybrid zones to understand the ways that organisms are responding to um, climate change and other changes on the planet is one that I started thinking a lot about as a postdoc when I was at Cornell. Um, and I just wanted to highlight what I mean when I say we can use hybrid zones as kind of windows on climate change. Um, I mean that we can look at these regions of contact between closely related species. Uh, in this case, you're looking at the a swallowtail butterfly hybrid zone um, that's been studied for a long time in Michigan. And studies of that hybrid zone and, and the changes that have occurred in that hybrid zone over, I think like a 40 to 50 year period, have allowed people to track the movement of various traits away from this zone of contact between the two species. So these things you're seeing at the ends of lines like body size, plant detoxification, these are all um, aspects that have introgressed or moved between species. So introgression is a trait uh, a term we use with respect to the movement of genes between species. And so by studying this, this hybrid zone between swallowtail butterflies that's responding to climate change, we can get an idea of what drives these patterns of introgression and how organisms might be responding uh, to the really rapid changes we're seeing in global temperatures. Another example comes from, from trees and you might be like, oh, I'm here to learn about birds. Uh, so why are you talking about not birds? I guess the point is that hybrid zones are broadly really useful to understand how species are responding to climate change. And then, uh, you know, the reason that we typically, well, the three of us study hybrid zones in birds is that they tend to be quite common. And so there are these really interesting regions on the landscape we can use to understand in this case with three species of spruce in Western North America, again, introgression of traits related to um, snowfall adaptation, elevation adaptation, and, and precipitation. So without contact between closely related species, we wouldn't know, uh, you know how they might be responding to these really rapid changes in climate. And so one of these hybrid zones that Bob will introduce you to in a minute is, is one between two chickadee species in Eastern North America that you're probably familiar with in large part because of Bob's body of work. Um, and then I'll come in afterwards to talk a little bit more about the more recent genomic work that we've been collaborating on. So you can use these hybrid zones to understand both how um, genes are moving between species in response to climate adaptation, but also how species ranges are changing. Um, and that's kind of more of what we've been doing with respect to black captain Carolina chickadees in Eastern North America. Um, we're, we called this talk kind of hybridization, avian hybridization and global change because climate change is one of the changes that the, the globe is experiencing, but another is large scale habitat changes from humans. So whether that's land clearing or the construction of urban areas. Um, and my, po uh, my, my postdoc, my graduate student, Catherine Grabenstein, who I think is here with us and who's defending on Tuesday, um, wrote this really interesting review when she started her, her PhD with me back in uh, 2016 about the fact that outside of climate change, which we know is causing species ranges to shift and hybridization to change in various places, just direct modification of habitat can, can also cause hybridization. And so this figure is just one from her review, which was published in Trends in Ecology and Evolution, talking about the ways that these human-mediated habitat changes can, can lead to hybridization between species that normally wouldn't hybridize. So whether that's because of a reduction in physical isolation or temporal isolation or the efficacy of signaling, uh, for instance, in hybridizing cichlid fish in Lake Victoria, there's multiple ways that human-mediated um, disturbance can lead to hybridization. And, and I'll talk a little bit about some of our most recent results in black-capped and mountain chickadees shortly. Um, but like climate change and the evidence that climate change is leading to movement of hybrid zones and potentially increasing rates of hybridization in various places, 
human mediated habitat disturbances are also being cited as a primary driver of hybridization in many systems. So when Catherine completed this review, uh, there were a number of examples across a variety of you know, different organisms from mammals, birds, fish, insects, and many plant examples. And this review was only published in 2018, but since then has already been cited 94 times, which is pretty incredible for a relatively recently published paper, but I think speaks to the fact that the more we look for these examples of hybridization following habitat disturbance, uh, the more we find them. And, and so today we'll be talking about various examples of this, but in birds. Birds hybridize relatively you know, frequently, although it depends on who you talk to. Um, there are a lot of avian hybrid zones in North America at least. And um, today we'll talk about chickadee hybridization. And then Sean will, will finish the talk by talking about within one area where we see a lot of hybrid zones, what's driving differences in the ways those hybrid zones are responding to change. Um, so with that, I'll stop screen sharing and I will turn it over to, um, maybe I won't stop screen sharing or I'll have to exit Zoom. <laughs> Something is happening that's bad. Can one of the other moderators it. force me to stop screen sharing? Are we good? Thank you. All right. <laughs> and can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Scott, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. Um, so as Scott said, we've been working on the chickadees in Eastern North America. Um, it's been a while. Um, we knew that uh, these two species were hybridizing uh, based on uh, a lot of work here and there. Uh, done um, over a period of 20 or 30 years, um, there was some indication that the zone had was moving based on work just before my lab got started on this. Um, the focus is on the parapatric uh, zone um, where the two, the northern species and the southern species come together. So uh, the fact that Villanova was right there is really a lot, had, had a lot to do with me getting started on this and focusing on this. Um, the, so we set up a, a set of transects or, or study sites along a transects what, uh, straddling the hybrid zone. Took us a while to figure out where it was. Uh, I think back when I started, this might be a picture of me. I'm not, not sure about that, but it feels like it's been a while. Um, so we've been uh, monitoring uh, some of these sites now for 25 years, We're going into our 25th season right now. Um, and so the work has involved a lot of people who I want to acknowledge right off the bat. Um, and some of these, we've kind of divided our attention um, to both aspects of hybridization that Scott alluded to, both the causes and the consequences. Um, today, I'm going to focus mostly on some of our recent stuff, focusing on the consequences as opposed to the causes, but uh, I'd be happy to talk about the other work along the way. Um, so we do uh, a lot of standard field ornithology, uh, but then we back it up necessarily with molecular ecology because they're chickadees and you can't tell them apart until you genotype them. Um, and the, our, our four study sites have worked really well as a way of um, keeping track of what's happening in essentially real time as the hybrid zone slides northward. Um, so the proportion of birds at each of these sites has gone through transition. So with our long-term data sets, we can track um, what has changed and then look at what other correlated variables have gone along with it, while also doing that other work that I mentioned about trying to understand why they're interbreeding in the first place. So early on in our study, we, uh, we confirmed uh, with uh, genetic data that the hybridization was happening, but a hint that the movement was going on came from an earlier study in Eastern Pennsylvania by uh, Ward and Ward in Chester County over here on the left. Um, these are um, the pattern of songs at that time. So the, uh, the uh, open triangles are the places where uh, the birds were singing black cap song in the 1960s. So by the time we got started, um, places like Great Marsh and Oldie Forest, um, well, Great Marsh, the birds were singing Carolina. By then, there was nobody left singing Black Cap Song. And by the time we got started at Noldy Forest, they were still singing Black Cap Song. However, our genetic work showed that that was already a hybrid population, a mixed population. So the fact that the, the wards had detected Black Cap Songs even farther south um, was an early indication that uh, 
that hybrid that the zone was moving quite quickly. And for those of you who may not be familiar with these structure plots, each vertical line represents one bird. So on the far left, we've got uh, black capped chickadees at Hawk Mountain because the bars are all white or almost all white. And then in the middle in our Noldley Forest population, uh, in the middle of these three, a lot of the bars are gray, some are white and some are black, which uh, reflects the fact that it's a very mixed up population or it was, this was back in the early 2000s. And at that time and still uh, the Great Marsh population at the southern, southernmost of our four sites was entirely Carolina. Um, so we started gravitating uh, with encouragement from Scott and Irby Lovett and some other folks to think about the um, extent to which and the ways in which climate change was driving this uh, shift. Uh, and Scott's gonna cover that in his section because we relied a lot on genomic analysis to do that. So what I'm gonna focus on is what's been happening, um, especially at Hawk Mountain where the action has been proceeding most intensively over the last uh, 20 years. So we've been monitoring every year. We have now about 200 nest boxes. We get 20 or 30 pairs each year. Um, and we've been doing the same methods uh, every year, pretty much. Um, so uh, recently, uh, Robert Driver finished his thesis working with me and he's now a PhD student at Eastern Carolina. Uh, but we have a paper that should be uh, on the accepted list or the uh, ex uh, recently accepted webpage very soon in American Naturalist, any day now, I hope. Um, so then the next few slides come from his analysis. And what we found was that the as the uh, genotypes changed at Hawk Mountain, we switched from um, pairs that were either pure, uh, combined black cat, black cat pairs um, at, at the beginning, that's all they were, um, and getting increasing percentage of mixed up pairs where either the two birds were opposite uh, genotypes or uh, they were both themselves hybrids. So what went on with that shift, and this is what the big focus in the paper is, that at the sites where things hadn't changed, hatching success stayed pretty flat. So that was true at Great Marsh, where it's all Carolina chickadees. It was also true at Tuscarora, where hybridization had not really started, although now it has. Meanwhile, at Noldy Forest, um, where it, the birds were mixed up at the beginning of our study, this actually shows a, a positive slope, um, just barely. Um, so the uh, occurrence of nests with very poor hatching success has gotten less bad. And at Hawk Mountain is the big deal where at uh, the likelihood of a, of a nest having a lot of eggs that don't hatch has gone, uh, has increased a lot. So the average hatching success has plummeted. And here's a pretty typical nest from Hawk Mountain. We've had some nests at Hawk Mountain where none of the eggs hatch and the birds will incubate for a month or so and then they finally give up. So included in this paper is looking for the linkage between the genotypes of the birds and the hatching success. And what this shows is as we go on the left from the admixed birds, so you can think of those uh, as F1 hybrids or, or equivalent, going over to the birds on the far left, uh, far right on each slide, um, those are the 100% black cap or 100% Carolina birds. There's a very strong connection between the hatching success to the genotypes of both the male and the female. If anything, this, the connection is strongest through the male's genotype. And another very intriguing part of this is that we found support for Haldane's rule, where in the nests of uh, admixed parents, there's more male nestlings than female nestlings. And that is what Haldane's rule predicts, that the heterozygotic females are the ones that should suffer. And we're still investigating uh, whether the eggs ever got fertilized as opposed to getting fertilized and then having the embryo die quite quickly in development. Um, interestingly, that, that the influence seems to be coming from the male as opposed to the female, which is kind of weird because he's, he's providing a, a, a Z chromosome as opposed to the W chromosome that's coming from the female. So we don't quite understand the mechanisms here, but it's a very intriguing pattern. Um, so another thing we've found is that survival, sorry, I'll get back. Survival, um, our data are enough to show that the hybrids have diminished survival at Hawk Mountain. 
And so that's led us to think about what's causing that drop in survival. Um, so Ari Rice asked the question of whether it was associated with malarial infection. We found a lot of a malaria, but it's not associated with the hybrid versus not hybrid genotype. Um, so his paper came out in ornithology um, early last year. And what we're doing right now most intensively is trying to determine whether the hybrid birds at Hog Mountain are cognitively impaired. So we're building on work in captive birds done by Amber Rice at Lehigh, who did find a deficit in uh, spatial memory and problem solving of the hybrids. Um, Vladimir Pravosudov and his group have done a lot of work in mountain chickadees showing the same pattern um, of variation in spatial memory and connecting it with survival. So we're expecting that we might find a combination of those two things in our hybridizing chickadees, that that decreased survival of the hybrids could be associated with poor spatial memory having to do with storing seeds and things like that. So we started this in 2020, uh, navigating around COVID and all that. And uh, this is what it looks like when the birds are coming to these smart feeders. Uh, the access to the food is dependent on the bird's pit tag. So the, the uh, system inside the feeder reads the tag. And if it's a, the bird is at the correct feeder, it opens the door and the bird gets a seed. If it lands on a different feeder, it's recorded as an error. So we're measuring the error rates. And the important thing about doing this in the field instead of captivity is that we can try to see to what extent does the bird's position in its social network and its dominance relationships uh, influence its performance above and beyond its genotype. So stay tuned for that. And with that, I'll close and stop my screen sharing. And thank you very much. Great. <clears throat> so um, thanks, Bob. That you know, it's, it's always nice to hear the newest stuff going on in the Black Captain Carolina Chickadee Hybrid Zone. And um, I started working on that hybrid zone as a postdoc at Cornell. And like Bob alluded to, um, when Irby and I and Bob and Vale and others started collaborating, we were really interested in what was potentially causing the movement of the hybrid zone and what were the consequences of hybridization. So in the next section, I'm just gonna talk about these two different hybridizing pairs of chickadees in North America. So Black Captain Carolina, which Bob has introduced you to. And then now where I'm located in Colorado, uh, Black Captain Mountain Chickadees, which spoiler alert, hybridize a lot more than we thought. So um, we'll talk about Carolinas and Black Caps first. Uh, so <clears throat> when I started working on Black Caps and Carolina Chickadees and had read the previous work coming out of Bob's lab and, and the work before that, I was really interested in trying to understand whether climate was a driver for the relatively rapid movement of the hybrid zone. Um, until this point, the hybrid zone movement hadn't been really very closely documented because there wasn't, you know, there was no kind of genetic analysis of temporal data. And so that was a big component that I contributed as a postdoc. And then in collaboration with Wesley Hachachka at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, we also tried to understand the influence of climate on this movement. Um, so like Bob showed you, the hybrid zone between Carolinas and black caps is moving. And my first contribution to this uh, was the paper that came out in Current Biology in 2014. And so here what you're seeing is the structure plot turned on its end, where here every horizontal line is an individual and then the color represents the genetic population that they assigned to. So you can see in 2002 that the Southern populations were you know, all Carolina chickadee, the middle population in 2002 still had some pure black cap chickadees, those dark bars that go across the entire, um, the entire width of the structure plot. And then Hawk Mountain, which is that top population in 2002 was mostly black cap chickadees. Uh, so we had 84 individuals from 2002 from Bob's long-term study and then about the same number from 2012. But because the hybrid zone had been moving so much, um, Bob has now five study sites, uh, or I guess Tuscarora is number four. Anyways, that site was entirely black cap chickadees in 2012, but from what I've heard, uh, that has changed since. So we documented that over you know, the course of a decade, this hybrid zone had moved pretty rapidly. Um, and uh, we revisited this data using a, um, alignment to a new reference genome in 2020, or 20, 2020 and um, found the same pattern, you know, the hybrid zone, we, we supported this idea that the hybrid zone is moving, but got more insight into 
potential parts of the genome that actually don't move between black captain Carolina chickadees. And this gives us uh, routes to investigate in terms of low hybrid fitness. So Bob talked about you know, low hatching success, but if the, if the eggs do hatch, um, we did, you know, Bob showed that this lower survival of hybrids is occurring and trying to understand what's driving that is a big part of uh, my work now. So um, we documented this rapid media, uh, climate mediated hybrid zone movement in chickadees. And, and a big question you might have, or maybe you already know is how, how did we link this to climate? Uh, we did that using eBird, which you're probably all very familiar with and avid users of. Um, and so I won't belabor the value of the eBird database, which has grown, I'm sure, by orders of magnitude since I was using the data back in 2000 and I guess 14 ish. Uh, but we used eBird distribution data and combined that with climate data from the PRISM climate group. Uh, and basically, we used the eBird data to map regions of overlap between Black Captain Carolina chickadees. Uh, and you can see what that looks like here. We used a jitter approach and we got a pretty good idea of the contemporary distribution of the contact zone using this eBird data. Uh, then we asked, what is the relationship between where we see overlap in black captain Carolina chickadees and average winter temperatures? And so we only looked at one climate variable, which I remember when we made that decision, Wes was very skeptical that we would find anything, which it's great to be skeptical, uh, but we did find something that was, I think, very uh, convincing that climate is playing a role in the movement of this hybrid zone. So we found that the probability that a site uh, is within the contact zone uh, is, is really highly correlated with average minimum winter temperature. So you can see this just visually when I overlay uh, where the contact zone is with average minimum winter temperature. But what we then did, and I think was the reason this paper um, was so exciting, at least to me and others, we used that relationship. We modeled this relationship to predict where the hybrid zone was historically. And we could confirm where the hybrid zone was historically using the genetic data uh, from the samples that Bob's lab had collected. And so this model that we built off of this contemporary relationship between minimum winter temperature and where the contact zone was actually almost perfectly predicted where the contact zone was uh, a decade ago. And so this strong predictive ability, although you know we're not actually testing uh, climate adaptation, we're just testing whether we have a good ability to predict uh, a relationship between contact zone and climate, um, it, I think was a very convincing uh, piece of information that says warming winter climates are probably driving movement in this contact zone. And we know that um, average minimum winter temperatures are increasing faster on the east side of the Appalachians compared to the west side of the Appalachians. And there's, there's some evidence that the hybrid zone is moving much more slowly in other parts of, of regions where these two species overlap. So the big question becomes, okay, this hybrid zone is moving, but it's staying pretty narrow. So what is leading to selection against hybrids? And, and there are a number of pieces of data we have now where we think it's either, or it's probably a combination of breakdowns in metabolic function, as well as cognitive impairment, like Bob was talking about. So we're exploring this breakdown in metabolic function hypothesis using, uh, we have an NSF grant to to look at uh, metabolic function in cold acclimation experiments, and this is in collaboration with Zach Chevron and, and Amber Rice, uh, to really try and understand the mechanis mechanistic basis of low hybrid fitness in the system. And at the same time, uh, in collaboration with Amber, uh, we're, we're doing more of these captive experiments. We're getting data on cognitive function, and then um, we're relating that to gene expression variation in the hippocampus, as well as overall genotypes for the birds that are brought into captivity and raised in captivity and then tested. So stay tuned for a lot more interesting stuff uh, coming out of, out of the Black Captain Carolina Chickadee hybrid zone from a whole genome and, and RNA-seq perspective. Um, but I just wanted to spend a little bit of time as well before I turn it over to Sean talking about some of our, our work here locally in Colorado, trying to understand how human mediated disturbances can actually lead to hybridization. And this is work that has been led predominantly by um, my PhD student, soon to graduate, uh, Catherine Gravenstein. So Catherine joined the lab when the lab started here in Colorado. And you've, you've just heard about the, the value of long-term field studies uh, from Bob's work, and I'm sure you already knew they were valuable. Uh, but when Catherine got here, we envisioned this long-term study that we called the Boulder Chickadee Study. So here in, in Boulder County, we have both Black Captain Mountain Chickadees. Um, but 
this is a really different system than Black Captain Carolina chickadees. Black Captain Mountain chickadees don't necessarily hybridize wherever they overlap. And I'm gonna show you kind of what the pattern looks like from eBird data, but we have a series of 400 nest boxes that we now use to monitor breeding on a yearly basis between these species. So um, the overlap between these two species is different than Black Captain Carolina chickadees and the patchiness of the hybridization is really interesting. So in panel C on the bottom right of your screen, all of those purple dots are if you go to eBird and you just pull out records of hybrid Black Captain Mountain chickadees and those would be individuals uh, sorry, individuals that look like that individual on the screen that have, um, you know, a kind of a smaller supercilium, a bit of brownish on their sides, but they look like what we might consider to be an F1 or a first generation hybrid. The patchy nature of where these hybrids are led us to, to ask the question, you know, is there a relationship between where we see hybrids between black captain mountain chickadees and human disturbance? And so to answer this question, Catherine relied on this human uh, influence index database, the last of the wild database, where across North America, based on a number of aspects of disturbance, including distance to roads, you know, density of human populations, and, and so on, um, you get kind of these metrics that vary from zero, uh, which is fully wild, no disturbance, to 60, which is like you're in the middle of an urban area. Um, this database is considered wild if you're at a level below 10. I'm happy to talk about the, the merits of, of using a hard cutoff versus a continuous metric. At any rate, um, when you look at, so Catherine genotyped a database of 500 individuals um, that were collected by our lab, as well as uh, Ken Otter and Teresa Berg's labs. And we found that um, the human influence index, um, you basically, you find more hybrids where you find uh, more disturbance. And I'll show you that in a second. But what I'm showing you here is, is that you find adult or uh, parental black captain mountain chickadees across all of these ranges of disturbance. So you see parental black captain mountains in undisturbed areas all the way through to city centers. But you tend to only see hybrids um, in, in areas that are more disturbed. And so when you look across the landscape, and so here you're seeing hybrid index, but it's normalized. So um, or uh, converted, so it only varies from zero to 0.5, where all the zeros are either black capped or mountain chickadees, and everything above that is some form of a hybrid. You can see um, that the hybrids are kind of spread all over the place. Uh, there's no hybrid zone, it's very patchy, um, but there is a statistically significant relationship between, um, you know, you, you do find more hybrids in disturbed areas uh, than in undisturbed areas. So because you find parentals in both places, but you find hybrids mostly in disturbed areas, it either means they survive better there or they're actually being produced more frequently there. But we don't know which of those is the answer yet. But this is a pretty pretty striking and interesting pattern. Again, here on the y-axis, you're seeing hybrid index varying from zero, which is either parental species to 0.5, um, which is you know, a, a first generation hybrid. Um, and so locally, we have these 400 nest boxes. So this data comes from across North America. Um, we we see this correlation between disturbance and hybridization. And if you look on the map on the left, you can see the front range of Colorado, basically, um, down in kind of the bottom right part of that box. And so here in, in Boulder, we're working in an area that's pretty heavily disturbed. Um, if you've ever been to the front range, it's only getting <laughs> more populated. Uh, but we have these 400 nest boxes to monitor um, breeding, and we, we find that there's actually an influence of hybridization throughout our entire population, which is not something we expected. So here we're using whole genome sequence data to try and understand degrees of admixture. And we see that there's overlap in breeding across the entire elevation transect. So from the left, or from the right to the left of the screen, you're going up about 6,000 feet, which is considerable. And when we started this study, we thought we'd only find mountains at the highest elevations, but uh, just last year, we had our first black cap chickadee nest at 10,000 feet. So we see broad overlap in breeding, which means there's the potential for hybridization. And then when you generate hybrid indexes for our population, uh, you can see that they're all shifted up, which is not something we expected. So our allopatric black capped and mountain chickadees in this plot, the allopatric black capped chickadees come from Missouri and the mountains come from California. And you can see that BCCH, those are the black capped chickadees from Boulder County. Uh, they all have an elevated hybrid index compared to the allopatric populations. And then there are a number of, of earlier generation hybrids, including one F1 female, um, and then you know some second generation hybrids and a lot of things that are kind of fifth to later generation hybrids. 
And we think we have the power to detect this because we're working with you know, tens of thousands of fixed differences between the species. But even for mountain chickadees locally, there is a higher hybrid index, excuse me, than you'd expect, although it's slightly lower than the black cap chickadee uh, hybrid indexes that we're finding. And so we didn't expect that our entire population would be influenced by hybridization, but this idea that human disturbance can lead to pulses of hybridization, which have long lasting impacts on populations, I think is an exciting one that we'll be exploring into the future. Um, so with that, I'll just conclude something you probably already knew, but uh, you know, chickadees really are providing some important insights into the impacts of climate change, uh, as well as human mediated habitat disturbances on the causes and outcomes of hybridization. Uh, and I'm excited to keep exploring these and hopefully have more to share in the future. Uh, for now, I will ask Sean to force me to stop screen sharing. For some reason, my computer's garbage today and happy to chat about questions later. Okay, there we go. Um, all right, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, um, at least in terms of species um, and move to some hybrid zones that occur in the Great Plains of North America, specifically focusing on a transect along the Platte River that runs through Nebraska and Eastern Colorado. Um, and this is work that I started when I was a postdoc in the Fuller Evolutionary Biology Program at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, I also want to thank Vale and everyone at AFO for inviting us to present today. Um, before I start, though, I want to take a quick moment to acknowledge all my collaborators on this research, um, in particular, Dr. Jen Walsh, as well as Dr. Bronwyn Butcher, uh, Dr. Vanya Rower, Vicenz Villacurri, uh, Dr. Dave Taves, and Dr. Irby Levitt, as well as my funding sources. Um, so Scott and Bob showed us the power of studying hybridization changes over time and what that can tell us about speciation in the face of climate change and habitat alteration. But what happens when we have multiple hybrid zones that all co-occur in roughly the same geographic space? By controlling for geographic position and structure, we can hopefully understand how and why hybrid zones differ even when they face the same changes in climate or other sets of changes. So this is where suture zones come in. Suture zones represent geographic regions where many different hybrid zones and contact zones cluster in geographic space. Just as most individual hybrid zones are thought to have formed as a result of secondary contact, suture zones are thought to have formed as a result of shared phylogeographic history, such that many different lineages diverged in the same or similar refugia with subsequent range expansion. Suture, the, suture zones thus represent an important model for studying the mechanisms that could be important in promoting broad scale patterns of speciation. However, while we know that these geographic regions um, that we call suture zones exist, there's still extensive debate on the mechanisms that maintain these areas. Uh, much of the debate really boils down to questioning whether or not suture zones are merely historical artifacts where and they represent the middle of where these taxa met after expansion from refugia, or if there are actually shared mechanisms that actively maintain all of these hybrid zones in the same place over potentially hundreds or even thousands of years. So basically, do suture zones represent a set of important biological processes that could be contributing to speciation across many different taxa, or are they just a coincidence that all of these hybrid zones are found in the same place? And this distinction is important because it has really important implications for understanding how future changes in climate and habitat and other aspects may affect um, all of these species over time. So to help address these kinds of questions, um, I focused on the Great Plains of North America. Um, across the Great Plains, there are five pairs of species or subspecies of birds that hybridize, as well as many other pairs of mammals and plants and insects that all meet in the same general area. And this potentially allows us to understand how and why about how and why biodiversity is maintained on such a large geographic scale and across multiple species. Uh, within this region, um, the Platte River flows from west to east across the Great Plains, 
through Colorado and Nebraska before it flows into the Missouri River. And it forms not only a natural transect across the Great Plains, but it's also a corridor that connects Eastern deciduous forest habitats to Western forests along the Front Range of Colorado. So the Platte River really provides this riparian corridor of dense shrub cover and trees that crosses the otherwise open grassland uh, prairie habitats of the Great Plains, allowing birds like towhees and orioles and other species to spread across the Great Plains. So as um, I mentioned, and my research in the Great Plains has mainly focused on uh, two uh, distinct hybrid zones, that between the Baltimore and Bullock's Orioles, uh, shown on the top of the screen, and uh, Eastern and Spotted Toeys, which are shown on the bottom. Uh, across the Oriole hybrid zone, uh, males are very distinct in their plumage characters. Um, so you can see a male Baltimore Oriole on the right. It has the fully black head and narrow wing bars, whereas the male Bullock's Oriole on the left has a largely orange face, a broad orange supercilium, and a big white wing panel. And hybrids can, uh, uh, represented by all the other individuals, span a spectrum that ranges from mostly Baltimore-like to mostly Bullocks-like. Um, Toeys are definitely a bit trickier, trickier to separate um, across the hybrid zone, since the two species don't differ from each other very much. Um, and the primary character that separates them is the amount of white on the back, with Eastern Toeys having no white and Spotted Toeys having a lot of white. Um, hybrids, again, span the spectrum between the two um, from fully spotted to not spotted at all, with the illustration in the middle um, kind of representing a relatively even uh, mix of the two. So since both of these hybrid zones occur in more or less the same place, one of my main goals, one of my main interests was to see if climate is affecting each of these hybrid zones in the same way, which is a key prediction of suture zones. To test this idea, um, I developed a series of climate niche models um, of each hybrid zone using both historical uh, hybrid localities from museum data um, and climate conditions from the 1950s, as well as modern localities of hybrids and climate conditions. So this allowed me to see if the two hybrid zones, not only if they've changed over time, but if they have changed, whether that could have been in response to uh, climate change through the hybrid zone tracking of particular climate niche. So just by comparing these two uh, maps, that of the historical niche and the current niche, um, we can see that it has changed over time with the current uh, location of the hybrid zone found a little bit further south and west than what it was in the 1950s. But just from looking at these two um, maps, we don't know whether that change that we see is in response, is actually in response to climate change or if it could be due to other factors. So to see if these changes are the result of the hybrid zone tracking changes in climate, we can actually take the set of historical climate conditions where hybrids were found in the 1950s and see where those exact same climate conditions exist right now. So if we do that with the Toei hybrid zone, we can see this orange blob um, here that represents the location of the climate conditions that the hybrid zone was found in in the 1950s, where that location would be now. And so you can see that these two, the orange and the green on the right, um, while they're both in the Great Plains, they're quite different and they don't really overlap at all. Um, if Toeys had followed climate, then there would be a much more overlap. We can look at this another way. We can look at a single climate variable that's, that's important um, in, in these models and see what the range of values um, were uh, in the historical uh, niche versus the current niche. And for this particular climate variable, we see that um, the historical and current niches are quite divergent and significantly different from each other. We can do the same thing for the Orioles. And in this case, a different story emerges. While we do see uh, some changes, just like we did in the um, in the Toei hybrid zone, just by comparing the the two niches side by side, um, we can again take the historical climate niche and see where those conditions exist now. And contrary to 
the TOEs, we see a lot of overlap in the orange and green areas um, on the right. And this tells us that the Oriole hybrid zone has at least in part tracked changes in climate and that unlike the TOEs, the Oriole, the Oriole hybrid zone may at least in part be maintained by uh, climate. We can again, oops, we can again look at um, the a single particularly important climate variable. And while the current and historical um, models are significantly different in this case, we see much more overlap between these two than we did with the TOEI hybrid zone. In addition to looking at differences in the climate niche and the effect of climate change on these hybrid zones, we've also started to look at the genomics of these zones. Most of this work so far is focused on the Oriole hybrid zone, where we have found some fascinating results. In particular, um, there appears to be an inversion on the Z chromosome, which is likely important in maintaining differences between the two species. Uh, we do have some other interesting comparisons that we can make between Orioles and Toeys that further highlights the differences between these two hybrid zones, despite them occurring in the same geographic area. One of the most striking differences that's easily visible between these two is the frequency of hybrids that we encounter across the hybrid zone. Um, here, um, hybrids are um, defined by genotype, with zero representing the uh, uh, Western parental species and one in representing the Eastern parental species, and everything in between is um, some hybrid. Um, so if we look at the Oriole hybrid zone, we see that hybrid um, individuals or individuals with a genetic admixture are less frequent than the parental individuals across the hybrid zone. By contrast, in the TOEI hybrid zone, birds with mixed genetic ancestry far outnumber parental individuals by quite a large margin, suggesting that there is weak or very little selection against hybrids in, in the TOEI hybrid zone. Whereas the frequency of hybrids in the Oriole zone suggests that there is some form of selection acting against hybrids. So just to summarize, we again see that um, in the Oriole hybrid zone, there appears to be a uh, strong selection against hybrids and that the actual hybrid zone itself appears to be tracking changes in climate, at least to some degree. While in the TOEI hybrid zone, there appears to be relatively weak selection against hybrids, and it does not actually appear to be following uh, changes in climate. So why do we see these striking differences between these two hybrid zones? One could be um, the evolutionary history of the species involved. Um, the TOEIs are a much younger um, species pair than the Orioles. The Orioles um, aren't actually sister taxa. Um, another could be um, different adaptations to environmental differences and just intrinsic differences between uh, these two systems in terms of mate choice, behavior, migration, and genomic structure. Um, we haven't dived a lot into the genetics of the TOEs, but the fact that there's a, an inversion in the Oriole hybrid zone uh, suggests that that could be uh, playing a role. So much of this research is still ongoing, but we can say that in the Great Plains, evolution is pretty messy and different conditions appear to be important for different species. And understanding just how messy evolution actually is in the Great Plains can really help us to understand how biodiversity is generated and how it might change over time in response to climate change, habitat modification, and, and a bunch of other changes. So with that, I'd be happy along with everyone else to take questions and thank you for your time. Thank you. That was great. Thanks. Um, so you can all now turn your cameras on. And um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and we'll call you and you can ask your question directly or you can type it on the chat box. And if you're on YouTube, uh, we will be reading those questions too. So. Uh, you can type uh, your question there. And I have a question for Scott, and maybe uh, you said something about this and, and I missed it, but uh, when you were talking about the hybridization of mountain and black-capped chickadees, 
and you have that map where uh, you actually have both parental um, genotypes and then you have the hybrids. Are there any microhabitat differences in the use, I mean, the use of the habitat that are destroyed when humans <laughs> impact <laughs> the habitat, when humans change the habitat? Is, is that maybe a reason for hybridization or? It it might be. So what Ken found um, in his work up in northern British Columbia, uh, he found hybrids between black caps and mountains in areas that were logged and then regrew deciduous and then would be colonized by black caps. And then you'd find the production of hybrids in their case, only in mountain chickadee nests via extra pair copulation. Here in Boulder, um, if, if Boulder wasn't here, uh, there'd be a lot fewer deciduous trees. So and mountain chickadees often undergo these these seasonal movements out of the mountains, but not every year. Uh, in 2020 was a big year for that. And we saw a pulse of F1s the next year. Uh, in, in a scenario where there were no kind of large scale deciduous forests, which there now are along the front range, I think you wouldn't see hybridization the way we do now. So I think uh, we think as a, as a group, you know, that planting of deciduous trees and kind of the elevation of black cap chickadee populations beyond what they would have been along some of these range edges might be one of the factors that leads to hybridization um, but there's a lot more to figure out there. Across our whole transect, we see them breeding in the same places, you know, boxes you can see one to the other. Um, there's about a two week delay in the nest completion though. So there is a window of reproductive uh, mm -hmm. isolation, but yeah, there are microhabitat differences. Black cap chickadees are less common in areas that are just pine or I uh, am and drier, but uh, there's, there's more overlap here than we expected. Thank you. Uh, we have a question, Dan Baldessari, you want to, I, I see you now, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> Scott, this was related to Vali's question about the mountains and the black caps in, you know, Boulder and the urban areas. Is there any chance that uh, they are being forced together because of bird feeders? Is that something that could be, you know, artificially inflating their interactions? Yeah, almost certainly. Uh, so, you know, during the period of time where they're most likely choosing mates, there are more mountains in Boulder than during the summer, and we do see them interacting at feeders. We'd really like to do a large-scale experimental manipulation to get at that, but the first step was just figuring out what is the composition of the population and how frequently do they interbreed. One thing I didn't mention, and, and I think this is something that is really important, black caps, uh, most black caps and mountain chickadee hybrids look like black cap chickadees. So, um, there's a reason that we didn't realize they were hybridizing. I think as soon as you're beyond the F1, they look like black caps. And so even in the hands, they'd be diagnosed as give, you know, called black caps. So yeah, much broader hybridization than we expected. And I think feeders plus trees and some other stuff is probably mixing up the habitat in a way that, that drives that. And then there's kind of long lasting impacts of those pulses. Thank you. Um... Matt, are there questions on YouTube? No? There are no questions from YouTube. Um, are there questions here? It's like Bob uh, has a question for himself. No, a question for Scott. Um, so I'm surprised <laughs> to hear you describe the, the mountain chickadees moving in uh, episodically and sticking around and breeding. Because when we've had black caps come down in eruption years from the north, um, they tend to be really big black caps that are coming from, we think, pretty far away. So that's very intriguing. It might be another dimension of different natural history between the two species pairs that has big consequences. Um, yeah, so I'd so. like to hear more about that. Yeah, totally. So um, Catherine has done a little bit of, and she's here, so she could also speak to this, but um, she's done a little bit of work looking at like the frequency of reported F1s, which is kind of a proxy for these pulses of hybridization. And certainly after the large scale movement we saw in 2020, there were mountain chickadees even in Denver uh, during the breeding season that I hadn't seen in my previous four years of living there. So I do think it leads to, to movement and then staying where they are. They don't all go back up into the mountains. Um, and maybe that's also something to do with the way we've screwed up habitat transitions uh, with 
with really mixed plantings of trees and as well as artificial um, pr provision of seeds. So yeah, we still have a lot to figure out, but it does seem it's, it's a bit different. They're not coming from that far away, I don't think. I think they're coming from the mountains like you know, a few miles away uh, versus a long scale or a large scale yeah. migration. Yeah. Right. And so with the, the Northern birds, not just chickadees, but other things like red poles and siskins and all those, there's a somewhat understood relationship between food crops and production population density in the North driving the eruptions. So I was wondering if you've got any sense of what accounts for the years when the mountain chickadees come into town? I think it's the effects of drought. So our mountains are getting a lot drier and there's a lot less food available because of the, the trees just aren't producing the cone crops that they should be. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a drought food rela relationship. Uh, but we also had a lot of huge fires nearby the year previous, which destroyed a lot of habitat that, you know, the areas that were burned in Rocky Mountain National Park probably are unusable right now for chickadees because they it was a really high intensity fire. So I think just a combination of all the things I don't like about the West. <laughs> just to be blunt, it's so dry <laughs> and everything lights on fire, but I think that has an impact on <laughs> as well. There are a lot of great things about the West, but fire is not one of them. Yeah. So Sean, you said that um, the research is ongoing. Are, is, are, is there somebody you or, or others uh, studying um, more in depth the differences between the two systems and what are they studying for you? Yeah, <laughs> so um, Jen Walsh is really um, taking the lead on a lot of the Oriole work. Um, mm -hmm. And we have a, a paper that we're working on, on the looking at the genomics of the Oriole hybrid zone in particular. Um, and I mentioned um, that th there's some really cool um, genetic structure or genomic structure um, of the Orioles where there is a really big inversion um, on the Z chromosome. And within that inversion, there appear to be a number of genes related to uh, color. Um, but unlike you know some of the other classic uh, studies that have been coming out, um, the, there, there's a lot of um, differences uh, between these two species. It's not just a couple of little peaks of, of difference. There is wide scale um, genomic difference uh, between uh, these two species um, with, with a lot of different functions. Um, uh, we haven't done that with the toes yet, um, but I just from some of the preliminary work that that we have done, um, divergence between them is very low, and hybridization between them is quite extensive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at any given site within the middle of the hybrid zone, pretty much every individual is genetically a hybrid. Um, so it, it's, you know, quite a different um, case from, you know, as you move from east to west or west to east, whichever direction you prefer to move, um, you see a, a very steep transition from Baltimore Oriole to Bullock's Oriole um, in Western Nebraska uh, and Northeastern Colorado, and just a very gradual transition um, across that entire length of the Platte River. Um, in the Toeys. Thanks. Um, do we have any questions on YouTube or more questions here? YouTube is quiet. We do have a few people joining us on YouTube, but they have not spoken up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if we don't have any more questions, um, I just uh, want to thank, oh, Joe. <laughs> yes. let me, let me <laughs> almost, um, almost finished. That's okay. I was, I was just <laughs> absorbing. I'm absorbing, I'm barely assimilating, but uh, 
the one of the things that we have here, I live in Oklahoma and stuff, and we have a series of hybrids that go across. And uh, you know, one of the things I've noticed because I've been I've done a bunch of work in in Western Oklahoma is that when I run into things like uh, indigo bunning, some places they just kind of start to thin out, and that's where you see the hybridization occurring with lazuli. So there'll be a lazuli come up. Uh, we had one year when we had a pretty good fire in in uh, the Wichita Mountains, which was what, one of my study sites there. And uh, we mostly saw indigo bunnies and all of a sudden there were all these lazulis that just showed up and they hybridized a lot. And it seemed to be, you know, there's, there is a habitat response because uh, lazulis really do come into the more heavily, heavily disturbed areas, but it just seemed odd that they would come in all of a sudden in one big batch because they weren't there before that. So. Uh, and then I've looked at some of the stuff that was there with uh, tit mice that, uh, and in fact, I just read two recent paper or recent paper that talked about how stable that hybrid zone was from when Dixon did his work back in the seventies to one that was done more currently in the teen years, the, in, in, you know, 20, 2010s or whatever. Uh, so I was, you know, starting to jumble things around and looking at things like rarification of, you know, the species themselves when they come into certain zones and they hybridize whether that's really just a stable hybrid zone or whether that's just opportunism that, you know, they don't have anything else to breed with. Uh, so that's what happens with them. Uh, to this thing with the tit mice where, you know, I know further in Southwestern Oklahoma, tit mice, I mean, the habitat there is kind of strange because there's broad open areas and then there's these outcrops of areas that have woody vegetation and stuff. And that's where the hybrid zone is to, Texas, where it's pretty much, you know, up, you know, continuous habitat potential for tit mice across the area, but there's, but apparently there's not been a recorded shift or anything of that nature in the hybrid zone. And I was, you know, starting to ask the question of why would a hybrid zone say stable? <laughs> and uh, that was my thought, you know, and, and so anyway, that's there. And of course I'm in, in places where I think there's verification in a lot of stuff, but, uh, Besides the tit mice, there's a hybrid zone between golden fronted and red bellied woodpeckers, also. Uh, there's some other species that meet in that zone, like ash throated and uh, gray crested flycatchers. And I, you know, I'm not sure it's, they're detectable that way, but I don't see hybrids or any levels of hybridization with those. And I'm, I'm sure that eastern, western meadowlarks come in contact, and there's probably some hybridization there, but I'm not sure that there are any discrete measures of assessing what a hybrid would sound like or whether they would sound, you know, you sort of say, oh, that sounds more Western or more Eastern like, whether there's hybridization with those also. But, uh, but anyway, that thing about the, the tit mice was sort of curious to me. Because it seemed to be a factor where the hybrid zone has been stable for, you know, 40 years. And I was wondering whether uh, that was something that could lend insight or somebody had thoughts on it that they, they might want to comment. I saw Sean shaking his head all the way along. <laughs> so, yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not as familiar with like the the geography of of Oklahoma and and uh, the the different factors that that could contribute to to that. But the the titmouse situation certainly sounds like you know a case where uh, and Scott and Bob feel free to jump in, but just from how you're describing it, I'm not as um, I haven't been following that literature as closely. Um, There's only but, I think, two sets of papers, one of Dixon and I think one that uh, a, a gal named Curry also, I don't know whether it's related and uh, Patton put out. And there was more, yeah. it was a mostly phenotypic, you know, they looked at phenotypic characteristics across the zone. Yeah, we're, we're actually collaborating with Claire on the genetic analysis of that hybrid zone. So that'll hopefully be submitted within the next few weeks. Um, the, I guess the short answer is within the hybrid zone, there's a lot of hybridization and outside of it, there's none. And it seems like hybrids, for whatever reason, there's weirdly strong selection against hybrids. Um, so why that would maintain it, I'm not really sure, especially with the habitat changes that are occurring in, in Texas. Although I guess, so we have transects in two regions. So those, the older and the younger contact zones, mm -hmm. they do look different as you might expect in terms of width um, and, and those sorts of things. But um, yeah, it would be great to get like contemporary data to see if it really isn't moving or if that's just, you know, especially with genetic tools, although they're pretty easy yeah. to diagnose, I guess, as hybrids, but yeah. So there'll be more oh, on that here, hopefully. 
the northern part of the range in Oklahoma uh, is really patchy habitat. Uh, I imagine if you consolidated the habitat in those areas and just took a look across those zones, that they have to fly between the patches, but but it might be wider there just because they they have to go further to find another. Potentially, and that also could be related to movement, right? So like in Ohio, it doesn't seem like the, the Black Caps Carolina zone is moving as rapidly. And it could be that it's just the habitat patches are so far apart that they can't track it as easily as in, in Pennsylvania. Also, you know, temperatures are changing more slowly there, but if the habitat is really patchy, it will reduce the ability of the birds to actually track any kind of change as quickly as they could in continuous habitat. Any other questions? I was just gonna add uh, for Joe that there is indication in some tits uh, in Europe that the relative abundance of the two species does matter. So with uh, Siberian tit and willow tit, which hybridize occasionally, it's usually because one is really abundant and the other one's quite rare. Um, that's one of the things that's intriguing about the Carolina and black cap hybrid zone is that they're both pretty abundant right up until where they bump into each other. Um, if anything, it's where they come together is where we see a, a slightly lower density. And we don't know whether that's uh, caused by the low production of of offspring because of the poor hatching success, uh, a density trough right in the uh, in the contact zone. It's complicated by the fact that the habitat quality at a place like Hawk Mountain is not that great. It's a limestone or sandstone uh, understory, and a, it's just not a terribly productive forest. So that it's hard to disentangle the two. Um, but it's there is some variation even within one family of birds in the importance of relative abundance of the two species as opposed to other factors. And I would guess the importance of habitat patchiness and, and selectivity also varies a lot in the different systems. We don't think that the, we think that black cap chickadees and Carolina chickadees have virtually identical habitat preferences in Pennsylvania. Any other questions? No, Matt, no questions on YouTube, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for presenting and everybody else for joining us today. And um, yeah, we hope to see you next, next month <laughs> in our next AFO Cafe. Thanks a lot. Thank you. This was great. Thank you.